Welcome to your second and last issue lecture on water issues. Before we begin, I want to remind you not to forget the D12 readings associated with this module. These readings are going to help the material covered in this lecture, and you can expect to see the material, material in the quizzes associated with those readings. I want to begin by talking about the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea is an excellent case study to bring up when discussing water issues because the Aral Sea really represents what can go wrong when water is diverted. Now oftentimes we hear the Aral Sea revert to when uh, diverting the Great Lakes comes up. The Great Lakes and the Aral Sea are two very different places clim climatically. Um, with that said though, the Aral Sea is uh, is a body of water that's fed by waters coming off the Himalaya mountains. The rivers that feed into the Aral Sea are what are known as exotic streams. That is, they're fed in their headwaters by areas that have a very different climatic regime, precipitation regime, than the lands that they flow through. The rivers that flow into the Aral Sea flow into a very arid landscape and indeed the Aral Sea is located on a very arid and arid landscape. What happened with the Aral Sea is that the Soviet Union under Nikita Khrushchev wanted to turn the area surrounding the Aral Sea into a, a, a big agricultural zone very similar to what the United States has had in its uh, western states and really make the Soviet Union into a powerhouse of producing commodities such as cotton. And so what happened was the Soviet Union began to divert all these uh, the all the rivers going into the Aral Sea away and using that water to irrigate cotton. What ended up happening is if you look up here you can see how in 1964 the shoreline of the Aral Sea was was way way out here it was a very large fresh body of water there was some saline content to it but for the most part it was fairly fresh by 1987 the the sea had shrunk by a significant mark by 1997 you can see that what at one time were islands in the sea are now becoming peninsulas and finally by 2005 you have only a remnant of the sea left. What ended up happening was now you have three hypersaline pools. Most of the fish are dead. What they did do is they dammed off this southern area and they've begun to fill in this upper area now. But that means that this other part is pretty much drying up still and it's expected to be totally dry very soon. Uh, this area used to support many different species of sturgeon. I believe there's no sturgeon left in the entire thing. Now there are some fish species up in here, but for the most part there's nothing going on. And cotton is the reason for this. Now we talked about last time what was going on in Texas with cotton, with the Ogallala Aquifer. In this case, there's still growing cotton and what's going on with this is you have these countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, these, uh, these countries are engaging in their diversion to grow cotton because now this country really doesn't know any other way of life. They can't go back to fishing because there's no fish left. And fishing is really what used to support the countries and the communities surrounding the sea. In terms of local climate, it's getting difficult to grow cotton because the sea used to buffer the climate. But now with that sea gone, you have much hotter summers and you have much colder winters. And the cotton crop is, for the most part, failing. Now moving on to the Colorado River, many people would say that the Colorado River is our Aral Sea. Like I said, people will refer to the Great Lakes, and by diverting the Great Lakes, we would add for Aral Sea. Uh, it would be an ecological nightmare, but at the same time, the Great Lakes are not fed by exotic streams. That is, the Great Lakes receive quite a bit of precipitation in the rivers that feed into them. Their precipitation when they feed into the lakes is no different or it's not significantly different than the areas that feed into those rivers. The Colorado River though is like the rivers that feed into the Aral Sea and that it's an exotic stream. The precipitation 
And the water that goes into the Colorado River comes up from in these areas. It comes from the mountains of Wyoming and it comes from the mountains of Colorado and in Utah. And then that water, when it melts down the mountains, enters an arid landscape. And there's no significant water that's entering in, so therefore that makes it exotic. Some other exotic streams in the world that you might think of that are well known as something like the Nile River. These rivers flow through arid landscapes, but their headwaters are in areas that have much higher precipitation. What that means is that in an exotic stream, the discharge decreases going downstream. You lose a lot of water to evaporation, and you're not really building up in a non-exotic stream such as the Amazon. The Colorado River, like many variable exotic streams, has a highly variable flow rate. A lot of their flow rate depends on how much snowpack you get in the winter. So in something like the Colorado River, the highest flow ever recorded was in 1984. That's when uh, this dam right here actually was very close to failing. Uh, afterwards, they took a look at it, and it would have just been one more day of those flood levels, and the, the dam would have been undermined. The highest average flow was in 1914 to 1923. And actually, you could extend this number through the 1920s but this was the highest overall average. We'll get into this a little bit later because this is a number that many people used in the western United States when they went to build dams. When they were building dams they, they took the highest average flow rather than the overall average flow and that had many implications in terms of dams failing uh, from being siltified or from dams that produce hydroelectric power not having enough flow going through them because to justify putting in the dam, uh, engineers would kind of tweak the numbers to fit so they could get that dam put in. Now if you look at these flow rates, the last time the flow was achieved of this average here was in 1600 to 1625 and that's based on sediment records. What's going on right now in this river is that you're getting flows well below this. You're gonna, in your Google Earth assignment you're going to explore some of the flow rates and the levels on the Colorado River, but what's worrying a lot of people is that what was considered for a while a drought in the southwest is now more or less looking like a reality to the region. What has happened from us damming the Colorado River and diverting what we call the lifeline of the southwest, and indeed it is the lifeline of the southwest because this this lake right here, Lake Mead, is what supplies Las Vegas with their water. If you look at something like Lake Powell, this is supplying a lot of areas in this region with the water that they need. Lake Mead is also where the Hoover Dam is, which supplies the electricity needed for Las Vegas. But if you'll take a look at the Colorado River, and if you look at this river in Google Earth, just right here you see it stops short of what down here is the Gulf of California. The Gulf of California so this is Mexico over in here, this is the Baja Peninsula. The Gulf of California was, is what this river used to empty into. It doesn't even reach the, the ocean anymore. It stops short and becomes a big mud flat. Now this has major implications on the, on the Gulf of California just in terms of its uh, ecology. But not only that, what's happening with this river is that by the time it gets to Mexico, it's so hypersaline that we have to treat that water at a very high cost to our, in terms of our federal tax dollars. This is a very taxed river, but indeed it is the reason why you have places like Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada, in many ways Los Angeles, all the different cities and the communities along here, they all rely on this river for water. If it wasn't for this river, you would not see the development that you have in the desert southwest. It is called the Nile of America, and for good reason, because it is an exotic stream and because it is diverted heavily for irrigation for traditionally agriculture, but now more and more for urban, for just urban water supplies. This river is full of reservoirs. Some of the more notable is uh, the Lake Mead Reservoir associated with the Hoover Dam, which construction began in 1928. You have diversions such as the All-American Canal, which takes water from the river. You'll look at this in your Google Earth assignment. From the river and over the mountains of California, all the way over 
to the Imperial Valley and from there that water is diverted and brought all the way over to San Diego. And then you have things like the Central Arizona Project which you'll also look at. And this takes the water all the way across the state of Arizona from way over in the western side of the state all the way over to the eastern side of the state to deliver water to Tucson. Although Tucson doesn't actually get the water in its surface form, what they do is they inject that water into the ground to offset what they're taking out of the ground in terms of groundwater. As I stated, the river never completes its journey to the sea, and there's many problems with the irrigation and salinization. This, as you go along down this river, the salinity levels get higher and higher because what happens is every time those that water visits fields, it picks up that much more salt from the fields, all the salts associated with the fertilizers and the chemicals, and it's recycled over and over again. By the time this water gets to Mexico, the water is so hypersaline that for a while it was killing the crops. From a treaty that we set up with Mexico in the 19, early 1980s, we desalinized the water, but it's very, very expensive. It was about $400 million to build this desalinization plant in Unum, Arizona, and it costs about that much annually to run. So what you end up getting is you get water that costs about $300 an acre foot brought to the people of Tucson, to, uh, to Phoenix, Arizona. And this water, people don't pay $300 an acre foot there. They're paying about $3 an acre foot. And this is a taxpayer subsidize. This is federal tax dollars subsidize this water. Here's an aerial view of the Central Arizona project. You're going to look at this in Google Earth, but you can see it's a very extensive project. And you can also see why these central delivery projects are not very efficient because as this river or as this diversion, this canal winds through the Sonoran Desert, you're talking about millions upon millions of surface feet area, millions upon millions of feet in surface area all evaporating away in that dry desert air. So this costs about $3.6 billion to put in. It delivers 1.6 million acre feet a year, and that's about one-fifth of the flow of the Colorado River. Now, the initial water quality problems that came into Tucson was because when Tucson got this water in the 1990s, they were relieved because of the groundwater Draw, withdrawal they were having. They were actually getting subsidence where the freeways were collapsing and everything. So when they got this, it was seen as a very big deal, but as soon as people started drinking it, they realized it was so saline that it was it was terrible. It was, it was almost poisonous to drink. So now what they do is, by the time this diversion gets to Tucson, what they do is they inject it underground and then Tucson just continues to withdraw groundwater, but that withdrawal is offset by what's being injected underground. These are just a few views of things like the All-American Canal and the Central Arizona Project. But you can see this is a river. This is, well, it's a, it's a canal, but it flows through a very arid landscape. And in your Google Earth assignment, you're going to calculate just in a small area how much water is lost every day to evaporation. That's not even counting what's seeping in. It's very inefficient. This is a desalinization plant. Uh, this is in Yuma, Arizona. This is what was $400 million to put in. Very, very expensive to run yearly in terms of the energy costs and the replacement of filters and all of the other costs that go with it. And this is all to just to treat the water before it goes to Mexico so it's not toxic to their crops. Another product of the Colorado River diversion, in this case it was uh, caused by humans, is the Salton Sea. So if you look at this in a in a global view, here goes the Salton Sea. And down here, this little patch here, this is the Imperial Valley. This is where a lot of our lettuce and stuff comes from in the winter time. You can see right here, this is the, the edge. This gets into Mexico. Not as much agriculture going on, but indeed, this is the Colorado River where it's flowing, but the Salton Sea is over here. The Salton Sea is created by a diversion of the Colorado River for what's known as the All-American Canal. And the way it formed, first of all, was it used to be the Salton Sink. So it was just an area below sea level, but it was, wasn't full. It used to be full way back about 10,000 years ago, 10,000 to 1.3 million years ago, 
periods, there were periods of time where it was filled with water during a wetter climate. But it's fairly, it's fairly deep below sea level. It's an extension of the Gulf of California uh, geologically. Now it's cut off from the Gulf now by uh, uh, the Colorado River's fan. Now the Colorado River has traditionally flowed through that area, but its current course has cut it off with this fan from getting filled in by the Gulf. What happened in 1905 was an enterprising uh, set of individuals decided that if they could divert the Colorado River uh, they could engage in some agriculture in this uh, these fan deposits. So they did, a, they did a diversion and they were diverting water from the river but then what happened was in, a, in 1905 a big flood occurred and that flood actually diverted the entire course of the Colorado River. It flooded out the Union Pacific Railroad line and it made what is today the Salton Sea. Now it's been maintained since then by executive order but what's going on now is traditionally it was fed by the excess irrigation water in the Imperial Valley. But what happened was San Diego, as it grew, bought up those excess of rights. Remember the first in time, first in line, and the use it or lose it with Western water law? So what was happening is what water wasn't being used and going to the Salton Sea, the city of San Diego bought up. So now what's going on with the Salton Sea is it's slowly drying up. And year after year, the shoreline gets a little lower and a little lower. And as more and more ir excess irrigation water gets bought up, that sea is eventually predictably going to just dry up into once again just being the salt and sink. So that All-American Canal, like I said, that excess diversion is now headed off towards San Diego. It's an area that is very much an ecological disaster zone. Every year you get these big fish builds up, they die off from botulism, uh, the pelicans get it. There's a there's actually a, a crematorium there, a commercial level crematorium just to burn birds so other birds don't get botulism. There's entire cities that were once uh, resort communities that have since been abandoned and it's a pretty grim situation. Uh, if, if you want to see a good documentary, there's a documentary called Plagues and Pleasures on the Salton Sea and it talks about some of the woes facing this region. Here you get an idea of how much agriculture goes on in the Imperial Valley to itself though. And all that red, this is an infrared image, so the, the, the green is actually injected with the color red. And the deeper the red, the more vegetation you have. But you can see how this is an irrigated landscape. You have the desert surrounding area, but then in this Imperial Valley, this, this former fan of the Colorado River, you have lots and lots of agriculture. This is where we get a lot of our fruits and vegetables in the winter time from. And there you have your All-American Canal. Right, actually it's right here. And it's bringing that water all the way from way over here in the Colorado River, all the way over here. And so that means that it's across the mountain ranges. Lots of energy needed to move that water. Lots of evaporation. What's happening right now in the Imperial Valley, though, is many areas are starting to get abandoned. And the reason why they're getting abandoned is that flood-based irrigation, if you're in a low area, especially in these areas where you have water that's flowing through some landscapes that traditionally have held water in a closed basin, you get buildup of salt. And every time you flood this land, unless you can go underneath and somehow flush out that salt, the salt that evaporate, that's left when the water evaporates away builds up and builds up to where now in some of these southern reaches of the Imperial Valley, you're starting to have to abandon the agricultural field because they're so salinized. Moving on into the Great Lakes, I'm not going to get too much into the issues of the Great Lakes, but... I would recommend if anyone's interested in some water issues with the Great Lakes, they read a book called Great Lakes Water Wars. This really gets into the Great Lakes Water Compact that I discussed earlier and why the Great Lakes Con Water Compact was created, but some of the many issues that surround the Great Lakes Water Compact. If we look at water use in the Great Lakes, we would see that 
a lot of people in the Great Lakes Basin rely on Great Lakes for their water. If we look at how much water is is returned when you look at water use, not a lot of it is actually consumptive water use. The majority of it is returned. This is because a lot of the water use in the basin is industry power generation to where that water is being returned. If we look at consumptive water use, you would see some of the bigger ones are Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ontario. A lot of this relates to agricultural use of water, especially in Michigan. Now Michigan claims that a lot of their water, that they use water and they put it back in the basin, but that's not totally true because when they engage in agriculture and they ship those products outside of the basin, they're bringing that consumed water in the crops outside of the Great Lakes Basin. And that has many places like Minnesota, who's very big into, into conservation of water in the Great Lakes, up in arms. Wisconsin is a mixed bag of opinion on that. We look at consumptive water use, and of course the big one is irrigation. And then of course you have public water supply that's consumptive as well. So between public water supply and irrigation, you have a little over half of all the consumptive water use going on. Now industrial, remember industrial majority of water use in uh, industrial water use is non-consumptive. However, there are industrial operations that do engage in consumptive water use. We look at withdrawals and consumptive uses in the Great Lakes and we can see that overall energy providers consume the most water of anyone in the Great Lakes. But the majority of that water is non-consumptive. It's just used to cool the materials. If you look at something like irrigation, the majority of the water that's used in irrigation is consumptive. There's also a lot of talk within the Great Lakes, and this also gets into the, the book Great Lakes Water Wars, and there's a lot of talk about diversions in the Great Lakes. And what people tend to focus on in the Great Lakes with diversion is they, they think that lake levels are falling because of the Chicago diversion. But what's going on in the Great Lakes is that really through the course of the 20th century, we've done a lot to divert water in and out of the Great Lakes. One of the biggest diversions that actually did have a significant impact was by putting in the Welland Canal here between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario for shipping traffic. That that increased the flow of water outside of the Great Lakes that traditionally was controlled by how much was going over Niagara Falls from Lake Erie into Lake Ontario. But what people also forget is that there are diversions into the lakes. You have one here in Portage, Wisconsin, but you have some very large diversions of water into the Great Lakes that traditionally flowed north up into Hudson Bay at the Ogaki Reservoir and the Long Lock Reservoir. These are both for hydroelectric power in Canada and what they did was they created a reservoir and filled that reservoir and then reversed the flow of these rivers back in to take advantage of the water flowing downhill and back into Lake Superior. These diversions, just one of these diversions offsets how much is moving out of the lakes. So you look at this in terms of diversions you have quite a bit of water flowing into the lakes. 1,500, 3, 000, almost 4,000. So you have 4,000, 5,000 some uh, cubic feet per second of water flowing into the lakes to where Chicago has 3,200 moving out. You look at some of these inner basin, you can see that there is a very big, big loss of water from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario. Nearly just over 9,000 cubic feet per second is lost from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario and then from there out the St. Lawrence Seaway and into the ocean. Here we have that in some more detail, but what this is showing you is that the Great Lakes are really a series of diversions in and diversions out. And one of the reasons why the Great Lakes Water Compact was signed was because the Great Lakes states were beginning to get very worried that there was going to be too many diversions out of the lake and that was going to have a significant impact on the ecology and water levels of the lakes. So now there's a compact that makes it much more difficult, albeit not impossible,
for states and municipalities and corporations to take water out of the Great Lakes watershed. Moving on into dams. Now dams is a topic that uh, was very controversial in the 1990s. You don't hear too much about it anymore. But these are some of the larger dam projects in the world. This is uh, some footage of the Three Gorges Dam in China. This, of course, is the Hoover Dam. This is uh, the building of the Hoover Dam. And this is the Grand Coulee Dam up on the Columbia River. Very, very large projects supplies quite a bit of hydroelectric power. However, dams are not without controversy. You can look at dams in terms of the pros and cons in terms of they do serve as flood protection. They do provide electricity. They do serve to provide recreational lakes and they definitely provide water for irrigation. The first purpose for constructing dams was to make uh, reservoirs to divert the water for irrigation and these dams expand back thousands upon thousands of years in human history. However, those dams in previous to the 20th century were fairly small and they didn't have too much of an impact on a river system. But with the advent of the 20th century and some of these super dams such as the Hoover Dam, the Three Gorges Dam, the Grand Coulee Dam, what these dams have done is they've altered the entire ecology of regions to where you have no salmon fisheries on the, in the west coast or very few salmon resources on the west coast primarily because all the spawning grounds for the salmon were lost. When you put in these larger dams, you tend to obliterate existing fluvial networks. What can also happen is natural river valleys get flooded. So if you have these river valleys where you have traditional villages or grazing operations and whatnot, the people in these valleys, just like what happened in the Three Gorges area of China, where you have millions of people who are displaced, these valleys are now underwater in the form of a large reservoir. Economically, two of the bigger ones is the soil erosion that occurs with the water that's flowing from where the underneath the dam to where now that water has no sediment in it and it's hungry to pick up deposits, so it's engaging a lot of erosion downstream from the dam. But more importantly is siltification. And siltification is important because no dam lasts forever. When we look at dams, we might look at them in terms of the strength of the concrete and failing from some type of a flood. But what you have going on with dams is you get siltification problems. And that's to where if you start looking, especially at these western rivers that have a very, very high silt load, these, these dams start to fill in in back of the reservoir. And so with time, you get more and more silt to falling out because that water is no longer moving and it's filling in the back of that reservoir more and more to where eventually what you'll get is you'll have very, very little water in there and the entire reservoir is filled in with silt. Now, of course, you can engage in dredging operations, but dredging something like uh, the intake valves on Lake Mead these, these reservoirs in the Colorado River that have very, very high silt loads can be very prohibitively expensive, especially when you start looking at these in terms of a very large area. So siltification is really the reason why no dam will last forever. And as you'll see in some slides from now, that some dams that were put in that really should not have been put in because of the fact that they didn't have a high flow rate and they definitely did not... Uh, could not be put in because of the high silt loads in the river, there are dams that were rendered useless after 10 years that cost several million dollars to put in. Another issue with dams is that you lose your riparian habitat zones. Now this is a big deal when it comes to uh, international flyways for migratory waterfowl, but also for people who are into, uh, into hunting, when you put in dams, if you if you ruin the habitat for waterfowl, you tend to ruin more than just that waterfowl ecosystem, and it can have implications on the fishing as well. That moves into spawning routes. One of the biggest reasons why there are no... It used to be traditionally in the Pacific, on our Pacific coast, that you would have salmon 
as far down as Sacramento. The Sacramento River used to teem with wild salmon. Now you don't really start getting to see salmon until you get up into places like Washington. And the reason why is all those dams on the west coast has destroyed the spawning routes for the salmon in the region. It's that habitat destruction that leads to the loss of the species. It's often not over fishing. Fishing of salmon in Alaska, you can go up to Alaska and get tons of salmon. If you're native there, you can net them. There's lots of them, and the reason why there's lots of them is that there are very few hydroelectric facilities, let alone dams, in Alaskan rivers. We take a look at dams in the United States. This is just a quick map I drew. I uh, compiled using some uh, data on a GIS, an arc map. And you can see that there are thousands of dams in the United States, and there are certain areas that have many more than others. If we were to zoom in and get into the details of it, we could see that there's quite a difference in the size of dams. But dam building in the U.S., it actually extends back into the 1700s, but in the 1800s, the majority of dams put in were, were either very localized community projects, or you might have some enterprising entrepreneurs who decide to put something in uh, to, for recreational purposes. Uh, there was a, actually a huge flood in the late 1800s called the Johannesburg or the the Jonesburg flood, and that was in uh, Pennsylvania, and that was an earthen dam that was constructed that failed in heavy rains, and thousands of people were were killed when that dam failed. But really, dam building in the United States began in earnest in the 1930s, and it began in the 1930s because of some he very heavy rains that we experienced in the 1920s. And in the 1920s, when we experienced those heavy rains, a lot of people were calling for dams because so many people lost property and even their lives in floods associated with very, very high amounts of precipitation in the 1920s. So we have high rains in the 20s, but we also have a need for public works in the 1930s. So there were quite a few dam building projects that went on to provide people with this work. Well, that dam building era extended from the 1930s into the 1960s. But by the time we got into the 1960s and 1970s, we really lost a lot of areas in the United States that truly could use a dam or needed a dam or where it was feasible to put in a dam. And the Bureau of Land Reclamation and the Army Corps of Engineers started competing for federal funds and competing with one another in where to put in dams. And what happened with that was the engineers in both groups started looking to Congress, and Congress was looking to get this money because a lot of money came in for other projects with building a dam. But in order to build a dam, you had to justify the dam. And so what the engineers would do is they would use flow rates from the 1920s in the late 19, the, the, the late teen years, and they would use those numbers when the rivers were above, way above average to justify putting in a dam, especially in many of these Western Plains areas. And these dams, even worse, oftentimes were made as cash register dams. And so you would put in hydroelectric power. And the claim was, was that you would use the hydroelectric power to pay for building the dam itself. Unfortunately, if you, if you use the wrong numbers for flow rates, you're not going to get that flow. And what's going to happen is that that dam is not going to become viable to produce electricity because there's not going to be enough water moving through to turn the turbines. And unfortunately, that's what's occurred with hundreds of dams in the United States, including some in northern Wisconsin on the Wisconsin River, to where now these rivers are that where you had a hydroelectric facility in to supply the power for an entire region now can only supply enough power for a city block due to lowering of the flow rates of the river, but not only that, due to increasing energy demand. So in the 1990s, there was, was a push for a lot of dams to be taken out of production because they're just no longer needed in many areas. So this, this is an example of a cash register dam. This is Lake Mead. And what's happened on places like Lake Mead and Lake Powell in Utah is that you're getting a lowering and lowering of 
of the reservoir. And as that reservoir lowers, that means that you have to put the intake valves in for water supply, but not only that, for dams ever and ever lower so those turbines can turn. And this is in the southwest to where year after year the river levels keep on going down. But these dams and the water allocated for agriculture was based on those abnormally high flow numbers of the 1920s. This is a former reservoir filled in with sediment. And if you start exploring the western United States, especially the western plains, if you zoom in on a lot of these reservoirs on Google Earth, you would see that you can see the former shoreline, and oftentimes you can see these massive mud flats. These are dams that were on rivers that have since dried up due to diminishing amounts of precipitation, but not only that, just by getting filled in with silt. And really had the engineers who proposed putting these dams in used averages of the course of the, night of the entire 20th century, and looked at siltification, they would see that it wouldn't have been prudent to spend several million dollars to put a dam in on a river where even though you spent extra millions on putting in a hydroelectric facility, the flow just wasn't there to support it. Not only that, what makes it worse is when you get in situations like this and the entire facility, the entire reservoir becomes siltified with in some cases 10 to 20 years after their construction. Very sad and a very, very big waste of taxpayer dollars. Now moving away from centralized delivery, the alternative to providing water is to move into more of a decentralized approach. And this is where instead of having big federally funded projects, you have more of a local community or even at the individual level of harvesting water. And you see this more and more in arid environments. One of the areas that you see this in is in areas that have cold water currents. So areas um, such as in South America where you get these cold water currents producing on a daily basis lots of fog, you can harvest that fog in the form of dew ponds or even fog curtains. We'll see a slide on that in a little bit. There's also been a big effort on making desalinization economically viable. Currently it's very energy intensive and it also has environmental implications. But there's also making cisterns. Now cisterns is something that people even in places like Wisconsin have been doing for years and it's catching on in a lot of areas of the Southwest. Uh, there's a radio story that I would like you to listen to in this module that talks about using cisterns and roof catching systems in places like Tucson, Arizona. And then finally Quanots. Quanots is, uh, is something that's been going on for thousands of years in places like Iran that many areas are now looking to use once again in places like China and northern India where the federal water delivery systems just aren't doing the job and so people are looking at cisterns and these quanats to really harvest the water in a better way. This is that story on desert water harvesting that I'd like you to listen to. But these are some dew ponds, and so these dew ponds are what you see all over the landscape in places like Great Britain, but in areas like China and many areas that have frequent fog, you'll see these, and this is what for hundreds of years cattle have used as a watering supply. Now this all comes about because people line these things with clay and then straw as an insulating layer, and what happens is the fog moves in and it condenses and collects in these areas. This is, a, this is a proposed fog curtain, a much more modern one than what was traditionally used. But what's been going on for thousands of years is the people who traditionally lived in this area would set up fog curtains to collect the, the daily fog that moves in in, these, in what is known as the driest desert in the world. But however dry this desert is, it's teeming with life, and this life in many different ways harvests a fog. And so in the case of here, what, the, what traditionally these groups would do is they'd put out these big woven curtains. And the curtains would collect the fog and it would run down into channels. And these curtains could supply villages with water of several thousand people. Now with the growing population, 
people are looking at how to get away from tapping into groundwater and harvesting the fog. And so some very ingenious ideas have come about to where you have these towers such as here that makes that harvest the fog by the water droplets collecting and then spiraling down and going to a base collection facility. There are millions of gallons of water in this fog and what's traditionally happening is this fog just gets evaporated away in, as the day goes on but if you were able to harness that this is a means of providing to this local community a good amount of water. The problem is, is that putting something like this up right now is very capital intensive. This is what that fog looks like on the landscape. Very, very arid landscape, driest desert in the world, yet it's socked in by fog on a daily basis. So harvesting that fog is a great way of making use of a resource. It's just you need the technology and the capital to put it in. Desalinization, there's also a story on this in NPR. The majority of desalinization currently relies on distillation. This is just you taking salt water, you're boiling off the water, the water uh, evaporates in its, in its fresh form, it leaves behind the salt, and then you condense it on tubes and it collects. This is very energy intensive because you have to provide the energy to heat the water. You can also engage in reverse osmosis. This also is related to that story that you are asked to listen to. But reverse osmosis also is very energy intensive because you need the energy to force that water through the, your filters. Both of these also are not without environmental problems because when you desalinize water, what you have left behind is all that hyper-concentrated salt water. And you have to be able to do something with that salt water. If you inject that salt water back into the ocean, what you're doing is you are at, at, introducing that into an ecosystem that cannot tolerate that high of a level of change in salinity that fast. And so what these facilities need to do is they need to put that water back into the ocean in a much slower manner and kind of diffuse it in. So this gets into these big pipe networks that bring it way out in the ocean and slowly disperse it as it moves along so you don't shock any of the marine life and cause potential fisheries collapse. Now Saudi Arabia currently leads the world in production of uh, desalinization facilities. Why does Saudi Arabia lead the world? Because they have so much cheap available energy in the form of crude oil. They can get away with this. They, they have quite a bit of capital because we're transferring 800 billion dollars a year over to them as well. But they also have quite a bit of energy to engage in this. Now Israel is also engaging in a lot of desalinization. They're doing it not because they're swimming in money from oil, they don't have any, but because they engage in a lot of agriculture and they're in a region of the world where there is very little water to go around. In fact, it's the source of a lot of conflict in the region because of what's going on with the Jordan River as you go all the way back to that home video project. Israel right now is leading the world in terms of it's the cheapest to produce. They have it down to where it costs about 50 cents to make 265 gallons of water. That's pretty good, especially when you start thinking of that at the household consumption level. This is what you would see at a desalinization facility. And so basically what you have is you have... Um, a large operation that's taking in salt water, it's processing it through, dis, um, through um, distillation or reverse osmosis, and then it comes out in terms of being drinkable water. These are quanots. Now quanots is where you're almost creating your own aquifer to where you have on these upland areas in the Middle East, such as in Syria and Iran, in these uplands, these are the uplands that are getting all the rainfall and even snowfall. And if you were to dig in vertical access shafts and then put in a horizontal shaft, you're pretty much making a perched water table and a spring outlet. And what traditionally these quanats would do is you'd have all these vertical shafts and then the water flows out here and into these fields that you can irrigate. This is something that can be done in the local level and it doesn't require a federal delivery system centralized delivery. 